Bar. Hi. As a um, um, medical developer and researcher, I, um, I try to repair organs that have been defected by diseases of any kind. And um, recently, my specialization is in, one of my specializations is in speech restorations for people that cannot speak anymore because they have their larynx been taken out due to cancer or anything. They breathe through this hole in the front of their neck. So I design artificial organs. And I hear a lot of people say, that must be really, really difficult. And of course it is. It is really, really difficult. But it's not difficult in the way that you might expect. So I singled out one of my research lines in chronological order to have you a little bit experience. What is so difficult here? I need the remote. When I got started in the speech restoration, um, I went to my first ENT, ear, nose and throat conference, um, because I work at the University Medical Center here in Groningen. And I went to my first conference and I was thinking, my background is industrial design engineering, a bit of biology, and I walked in there into this group of these experts that have been working on all their subjects for decades. Experts. So I went there in hesitatingly into the first um, lecture, and I watched there. Oh, I watched there up on the screen an X-ray picture cut through of a human head, and I envision inside there in the throat a square metal box, and people were discussing why an artificial throat that they had designed was actually being rejected by the patient's body. And they were discussing, yeah, somebody said, is the, um, what's the grade of the titanium used? Was it pure enough? And I said, ah, it might be something to do with the, the texture of the material. Yeah, did you work completely aseptic? What was the surgical procedure? And I was just looking up there on that screen, looking at that square box in that soft tissue with all those curvy lines. And I was thinking, put my hand up and I say, but... It's, it's square, and it's hard, and if I were a body, I would try to get rid of it. And the people frowned at me, and, and they just continued their discussion about the grades of titanium use, and I was thinking, I was surprised because I was not put off by the fact that I just obviously asked a stupid question. No, intuitively, I was thinking, intuitively, I was right. And they sort of didn't understand my remark, or they missed the point. And then, there at the moment, I thought, I can actually contribute something. What if this, this implant would not be made out of metal, but of something else? And then I started looking around, looking at other prosthesis, and I found out that since the First World War, where they mass repaired bones and everything in, in, in soldiers, they used hard materials. And ever since, it's been sort of the, met the material under use for implants. And then I looked around into the world, and I noticed that many things around us are actually really hard. And if they're soft, then they try to reinforce them and make them harder. And I thought, would it be fun? Would it be nice? Would it be, be better to use a soft material just as soft as the tissue surrounding it? Why not make implants out of silicon rubber? Well, at the time, I was also uh, founding the medical product development lab here in the University Medical Center. And we decided, my students and I, we decided from now on, if possible, any assignment that we would get, we would only be able to make it out of rubber as to get experience with using the, um, the using rubber. So, how would you make something out of rubber? Well, you cast it in molds. So we went to the experts asking, so how do you cast silicon rubber? Because silicon rubber was the easiest to make. And they said, well, industrially, you would use steel molds, and, uh, but you make it for prototyping. Why not use brass molds? So, okay, we built our first brass molds, and we injected silicon rubber into it. And then we found out 
it's actually really difficult to look inside the mold once you're filling it. And you don't know if you have air bubbles inside, and only once you've put it in an oven and heat it up and you've hardened the material inside, you open it, you see if you actually filled or not. Uh, but yeah, the expert says, use brass. But then we thought, why not have a material that you can actually look through? Something transparent, why not use something cheap, like Perspex? So I went up to the experts saying, um, could we maybe use Perspex for molding silicon rubber? And they said, why would you use Perspex for silicon rubber molding? And we said, that's cheaper, and it's easy to machine, and it's light. And you can see through it, and then you can see if your filling of the mold is correct. And they said, wow, but, but that's a good idea. Why didn't we think of that? And I don't know why they didn't think of that. So we made our uh, molds out of, out of uh, Perspex, and, um, and they worked. So we built our first little things to start playing with, see if we can actually make a material have something in our hands, uh, see what it feels like. And they were thinking, what could you do then, now that we can actually cast something, what could you do with silicon rubber that you cannot do with hard materials? Well, of course, you can, you can stretch it. And you can inflate it like a balloon or like a tube. You can, uh, you can twist it. But the most important thing that we found out, the most exciting thing about silicon rubber, is that you can cast things inside out. Like if you make a shirt and you want to um, sew the, uh, the seams, you, you, you sew the seams on the outside, then you take the shirt inside out. And then you yeah, previously you had access to your seams and now they're hidden, so now your shirt looks good on the outside. So there's things that you can do with silicon rubber. So we started working. Um, we had received our first assignment um, for people that breathe through this hole like this. Um, uh, uh, scientists were asking, could we maybe measure the pressure for these patients while they are speaking? Of course, said, we said we can make such a device, uh, but of, we understand uh, this can only be done in silicon rubber. So we made a pressure plug, which had a part that we molded inside out, and this is this little part. And you move it over itself, and then you have this little cushion. And then you ask the patient to inhale, press it against the stoma, exhale, and you measure the pressure inside. And it's very comfortable and it's airtight. So we had our first thing to cast a little bit inside out. But we were thinking, uh, this went okay. But if you take a tube and you put it inside out, you notice that actually the size changes. The outside gets uh, expanded and the inside gets smaller. So maybe are there general rules to casting inside out? Because obviously this is something that you can do with a rubber, so experts must know how you cast the inside out. Because we were just new in the field. So I went to one of the major ex experts here in Holland that make conduits for axles, for boats with propellers on the outside, with seawater. So the conduits are, inside, uh, are like sealants to keep the water from seeping in. And uh, they make cable conduits and things, everything that has a sealant function. I went to the company and said, well, you obviously have a lot of expertise in casting. Yeah, we've been doing this for over a century almost. Excellent. Can I ask you some uh, questions about uh, casting? Yeah, go right ahead. Um, okay, so are there some general rules for casting things inside out? And he said, well, <laughs> why would you cast inside out? And I took one of their Excel um, conduits, which are these rubber tubes, and inside the rubber tubes are um, there, obviously there's a hole for the axle, but there, there's, there's this chambering inside that you can fill with air pressure to expel water or fill it up with grease. So I took one of those uh, conduits, I flipped it inside out, and I thought, no, well, if you do it like this, then the walls are on the outside, and you can make a much easier mold to cast it. And he said, wow, <laughs> wow, uh, why didn't we think of that? I don't know. I don't know why they didn't think of that. So, we went home, we went back to the lab, and um, we found our first major assignment, and that is make a so-called hands-free speech valve for patients that need to close, close the hole in order to speak, so that they have their hands free, something that blocks this hole automatically on breathing. 
we found a completely um, uh, new uh, fundamental way to do this as compared to what is already on the market and for patients it's always nice to have alternatives to choose from. So we started working on this device and we needed something to switch and we found out this little happy face. You've all found it on your chair. And if you take one of our first prototypes, you see that we also have this little sphere inside that you can open and close. And this might be a switch. This would be handy as a switch. It's actually a sort of a memory that remembers a sort of state that it's in. And open, close. So um, might there be ways to calculate how this works so that we know that the dome is the right shape for the pressure that is actually at breathing or speaking for the patients? Literature. So we went into literature and we started looking for formulas to calculate this. But nobody ever. Um, investigated this. This happy face, as you might see, some don't even work because it's like the pe people that made it, they guessed. There are no clear formulas for this because normally these domes, they're called, this is called, what I just did, it's called B-stable buckling of semi-spherical shells. We found that out. In, 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 in mechanical engineering, it's called collapse. People don't want it to happen. It's church domes that collapse. It's pressure vessels that explode. And so we didn't find anything that says, you know, you make it with these sizes so you can flip it 10,000 times. No, we didn't find it. But if you cannot calculate it in mechanical engineering, you go and simulate it on a computer. So at the time, we had our new prototype uh, worked out. And um, I called one of the simulating experts. I said, well, can you simulate uh, silicon rubber B-stable buckling of semi-spherical shells? Sure, he said, come on over. So I went over to him and I showed him uh, this little sphere. And I said, this sphere, this can uh, go in and go out. He said, yeah, it's no problem, it's a simulator. Yeah, but uh, the other thing is that um, actually we uh, first take it inside out before, we've, um, before we be stable buckle it. And he said, whoa, yeah, but we cannot simulate that. I mean, if you take it inside out, then, you know, the size changes, you have internal stresses and pressures, you know, that'll take, that'll take us months. So, we could not simulate it, they said, on a PC. And we were thinking, yes, we can simulate it. We can simulate it with our brain, because at the time we'd been playing so much with silicon rubber, just holding it in our hands, making, making uh, prototypes from uh, clipped off ears and noses from, um, from plastic bunnies, and, and feeling it, and then if you start drawing it on a whiteboard, then you, you notice that after a, f a few days, you start understanding how the material works. And it's completely different than working um, with hard materials, as people would traditionally do. Because now you're not dictating your material. You cannot say, this goes there, and then it stops because it hits this, and then we drill a hole, and otherwise we reinforce it. No, you have to persuade the rubber to work in such a way. And then you draw something, and it works. And of course, in a scientific setting, you have a bit of a problem then. Because you cannot prove that it works. Yeah, you prove it because you build it, but you don't have any scientific foundation for it. So, this, you need this entire new language to persuade the material to work in such a way. Oh, you didn't read that one yet. <laughs> this is the problem that we had. And if you look inside, you see how this little skirt, it rolls up like a, li like a little jellyfish. This is not dictated. This is the material doing its own thing. Fun thing is that I had a student which was this die-hard mechanical engineer, and we started sketching together, and he always frowned upon the sort of language that I used, talking about his materials, let it go that way, make it more smoothly, it doesn't want to go that way, and he was drawing it, and he said, no, Art, if you take it inside out, you can't, no, it doesn't want to go that way, you have to, you have to make it more friendly. And then he stopped, and he looked at me and said, Art, I'm beginning to sound almost, almost like you. And it was, as at, at the moment, he realized that materials have feelings too. <laughs> so, um, it works. Um, Lisbeth tried it. Dear friend of mine, she tried it. She's, she, it works for her. She can speak with it, hands-free. So it does work. 
But my message is, my message of today is that to all of you here in the audience that feel young and inexperienced, or to those that are really experienced, they're experts, but sometimes they feel you have to suppress a, a gut feeling on how something, how, how something would work. You have to suppress a gut feeling in favor of scientific foundation or anything. Trust your intuition. Because the difficulty in engineering is learning to trust your, um, uh, your intuition. Thank you very much.